again, this is Mr. Brass. Now, the following vid is a mostly atheist vid meant for Christians, but I felt the questions for the most part were easy and that ideas like myself could answer them. For this series, I'll be trying to take off my deist lens and try to give an honest Christian perspective. I will appeal to philosophy, theology, and scholarship in these videos so to be able to go effectively over them. I'll also note that the reason I am doing this in a series format and not just one long video is to increase the number of vids on my channel along with making it easier for the questioners to respond back to. If God is going to be posited for an explanation for human existence, then by what mechanisms, meaning by what activities and interactions that are organized in such a way that produced humans, did God use? And by what means could we discover those mechanisms? Couple of points. I feel you're making the assumption that God is a sort of scientific claim in which we need a scientific cause for. God is a metaphysical claim, not a scientific one, as I've pointed out in my appeal to theologian Keith Ward in a previous video. Science can influence the probability of God's existence, but concluding with something on the matter is outside its realm. Also, I believe you've committed the fallacy of a single cause by assuming there is only one type of acceptable explanation, aka through scientific mechanisms when there is a second one, a.k.a. agent causation. Outside of scientific explanations that deal in terms of laws and initial conditions, we have personal explanations in terms of an agent and its volition. Any personal agent like humans, or in this case God, would fall into the second category, in which we would not really expect a more mechanistic approach, and deduction would be more useful in establishing what God does. Deduction is more conclusive than induction, and I'd say it is useful in things like mathematic, logic, history, and theoretical physics. If you still insist on scientific explanations, I'd recommend checking out Johann Rotz, in which, he, which through an idealistic perspective, he goes through the science of how they all interact. Fretkin's other, Hilbert space, and quantum probability waves, along with Holographic interference patterns are just some of the things he appeals to in order to show how connected the supernatural and the natural are. Lastly, I could simply just take the agnostic approach and say I don't know how God did it. I can be quite comfortable leaving it as a mystery that needs further inquiry. Among even the most fundamentalist of Christians, there are always people who interpret some part of the Bible metaphorically. Like in the book of Job, they talk about the four corners of the earth. Even fundamentalist Christians, for the most part, interpret that as metaphorical because we know there are no four corners of the earth. So when we find something in the Bible that doesn't necessarily reflect fact when interpreted literally, how can we definitively tell that that was intended to be interpreted metaphorically and not literally and is actually a falsehood? Biblical scholarship, that is how we come to find out what was most likely meant by a passage. Also, the four corners of the earth is Isaiah 11.12, not Job. This, as biblical scholar Dr. Gerald Umerian notes in his book, The Salvation of the Remnant in Isaiah 11.11-12, 11 is an idiom that refers to the totality of God's redemption to the people of Judah and Israel. We can deduce this from the fact that the word for corners here, a.k.a. kanef, refers to the wings of a bird. Thus, it isn't supposed to be talking about the earth's actual shape, but merely God's power over the situation. What are your reasons for not being a Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, or follower of one of the many other non-Christian faiths? Is it because you've devoted enormous time and energy to systematically investigating and debunking all these other religions? If you haven't done this, how can you in all honesty claim that your religion is superior? And if you're only a Christian because you happen to have been born into a Christian family, or you were raised in a culture or society where Christianity is commonplace, what about all the other people who, by a twist of fate, 
have been raised believing one of the many other religions that God has allowed to proliferate. I could imagine a Christian saying the historicity of the resurrection is what convinces them and leave it at that. Also, debunking all of the other religions is not a requirement I'm aware of. Almost all beliefs are probabilistic, and simply saying after an investigation of religious claims that Christianity is more plausible is reasonable. I'd like to note that many religious people accept troops in other religions but disagree with them on the details. Even Paul in Acts 17.22-31 acknowledges other people believing in different gods and having their reason for that, but he didn't aim to debunk them, but rather to inform them. I myself am knowledgeable on religions, as I defend the Abrahamic religions, have subscribed to a Hindu channel, have made friends with people of diverse religious beliefs, and got books on Taoism, Shintoism, and funny enough, Scientology. I'd also like to state, if you're making the claim that because Christians came to their belief because they came from a Christian background, therefore that accept that affects the validity of their beliefs, that is called the genetic fallacy. Why would an omnipotent, all-powerful God need a human sacrifice in order to forgive people their sins? If this being is truly capable of doing anything, has unlimited power and resources, and is all-loving, why would it require a brutal torture and killing? Why would it need a blood sacrifice and not just simply forgive people their sins, especially if it knew their motivations and could judge people according to their intentions? This, this has been answered by St. Anselm of Canterbury for more than 900 years via his book Why God Became Man. This was a popular question in the Middle Ages. So to ask this makes me think you haven't really investigated into the matter. Simply put, since man was separated from God with the sins he chose of his free will to do, and God himself bridged the gap between man and himself by becoming man, Jesus' sacrifice was that of a penal substitution where sin is the debt and God is the judge. Our debt was too much for us to bear, and God recognizing this came down and took the form of the man and paid the debt for those who come to him. If you believe in God, the debt is paid. But if you do not, the debt goes unpaid and it will, um, it will burn you per se. Although it will more or less come down to shame, not burning in the literal sense. A variety of religions, from ancient Greek beliefs to Native American beliefs, both past and current, account for gods that have relationships with their believers and with their servants. Why do you feel like the relationship that you claim to have with Jesus Christ is somehow special or unique and somehow invalidates how all other believers feel about their gods and their connections with their gods? Your question is a non sequitur. Specialness is dictated by our feelings towards something, not by the fact that the thing is one of a kind. For example, there is nothing inherently special about a teddy bear. They come in a massive bulk, and you can buy one from the store pretty easily, with no hassle. But try telling a little girl that her favorite teddy bear isn't special. Similarly, someone's relationship to God can be special in the sense that they deem it special. Also, I'd like to point out that not all religious experience is one and the same. A lot of the Eastern religions, their experience is more or less of being one with nature and so forth, while on the Abrahamic religions, God, with God, it is the feeling of like having a loving parent in your life. Lastly, while you didn't say it, I will add though, that the uniqueness of something doesn't dictate the truth value of something. The idea of the universe being old and there being a multiverse is not a special idea, as there were plenty of religions and philosophers who discussed it well before our science caught up to it. In the Old Testament, God didn't like all the unrighteous people on earth. So why did God choose to get rid of all of them with a global flood? Presumably, he could have made them painlessly vanish with a silent snap of his immaterial fingers. And why, after flooding the whole earth, did God decide to hide all evidence of his act? Atheists make this sort of objection a lot, aka why didn't God do things X way, and if I were God, I would have done things this way. 
This assumes that a mere human mind can understand the actions of God. It's like saying a flea can understand the ideas of man. God could have had a just reason for doing the flood. Perhaps doing the whole vanishing trick would be more harmful than good. I'd also like to say this assumes the literal global flood interpretation is true. I go for the worldwide flood interpretation where the flood was worldwide in the sense that it was all the world that the ancient um, Israelites knew. Why is it that the believers in every religion in history were wrong about their respective religion, despite having the same amount of conviction and evidence as you do for Christianity. It seems to me that you're already an atheist when it comes to all other religions in history, but somehow the one you happen to be born into is the one correct one. One, you commit the post hoc erger proctor hoc fallacy, where you assume that because alternate theories exist that they have some sort of bearing on reality, when that's not how things work. Two, you assume that the evidence is even on all these gods, which, when this is not so, material gods that occupy in a material universe and act on a material earth have a different expectation of evidence, and many have been debunked by science and through philosophy, and at least on the Christian claims, it rests on history, which can be, in theory, disproved. 3. The genetic fallacy, and lastly 4. You use the non-scholarly lack of belief definition, which makes no sense in of itself, but even granting you your terms, you're still wrong, as you're equivocating on the word atheism. On one hand, you have it meaning a lack of belief in gods, but on the other hand, you change it to a lack of belief in particular gods. God is all-powerful and all-loving. Why does he require blood in order to grant forgiveness? Old Testament or New, something had to die before he could forgive anyone. Human beings can forgive each other without there being a death first. Why can't God? It has to do with the level of sin and God being just. God doesn't just wave his hands at sin. Think of God as a judge where conditions have to be met in order for you to be let off the hook with him. Sin is really a crime or some say an honor offense against God, and the more you sin, the larger quality of depth you're in. Before Jesus, other sacrifices had to may, be made, which didn't pay off the debt, but more or less showed commitment that the debt would be paid off later. Think of animal sacrifices as credit cards. They didn't pay for anything, aka discharge our sin debt, but showed your commitment and trust in God for salvation. Now, on the Christian worldview, Jesus paid the debt back fully, but only for those who repented for him and had believed beforehand that God would offer salvations. Atheists, since they reject it, their debt has still gone unpaid. If you've never been to the ends of the earth, if you've never been to every planet, if you've never been to the corners of the universe, how do you know other gods don't exist? Depends on what you mean by God. Now, this God, it sounds like you're describing, would have to live in the material universe, and therefore, we can go more probabilistically through science and philosophy to debunk or confirm the God, like we do with any other claim. Location doesn't matter if the attributes are contradictory, and the more localized it is, the easier it is to fall into the there is no Muslim as United States president category of negative claims. There are thousands of other religions out there, many of which have millions of followers. So according to your logic and theirs, anyone who is a blasphemer to your particular deity is going to be condemned, whether it is to go to hell or to be reincarnated as a less intelligent animal. If your god is true, why is it that he would even allow the minds of humans to be so easily deceived into believing other religions? He essentially would have created brains that can be fooled and ultimately will send these people down to hell. In addition, how do you know you're not one of the people who have been fooled? On the Christian perspective, mankind is in a state of rebellion against God. So the fact that a lot of other people worship false gods and false prophets would make perfect sense on that worldview. It's not God's fault for mankind using their free will to screw up. God could have also allowed this for just reasons. 
because it just so happens that perhaps this is the best way to make sure that a maximum number of people come to be saved by him. Truth doesn't fear curiosity, testing, or doubt, which inoculate us against charlatans and scams. But if your beliefs stand up to scrutiny, then why is Doubting Thomas vilified as the bad guy for utilizing the scientific method, while the rest of the disciples are congratulated for following like blind sheep? Thomas wasn't a skeptic, but a denialist. Beforehand, he had the testimony of 11 of his closest friends to the event, seeing Jesus perform miracles, including raising Lazarus from the dead and seeing the empty tomb. Point being, Thomas had more than sufficient evidence, but he denied all of it. Thomas essentially wanted J Jesus to be his wish-fulfilling genie. This whole notion of faith being belief without evidence is completely baseless. And like the renaming of atheism, it was done for propaganda and strategetic reasons. Not once in the entire New Testament did the missionaries give personal testimony as evidence. Acts 10 had Luke appeal to numerous witnesses that drank with Jesus after his resurrection. And in Acts 2, 22 through 36, Peter appealed to Jesus' miracles, empty tomb, and fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. None of them simply believed in Jesus without merit. You've been making money being an atheist, criticizing religion for so long, and yet know nothing more than Ken Ham in terms of biblical scholarship. Sections of Christian theology, there's typically one of two afterlifes you'll get into when you die. There might be different subsects of this, but generally speaking, there are these main two ones, heaven or hell. So my question would be, why would you want either of those? Let me lay it out. You can either go to heaven and have no free will, or you can go to hell and burn forever. Take your pick. If you go to heaven, everything's happy at all times, which means you're not allowed to feel sadness. You'll be worshiping God until the end of days, and there's going to be no end of days, so it's going to keep going forever and ever, which means you effectively have no will of your own. You are forced to worship this deity until who knows when. Now, if you go to hell, then you're going to be burning forever, but at least you have your free will. In neither of these are you given a choice or a chance to be anything but what you will be shaped and molded into. In both of these, you will effectively be a slave. Whether you have your free will and you're burning and tortured, or you have no free will and thus are effectively stuck in unending servitude. I don't believe either of these places exist, and I have no reason to believe either of these places exist, but it seems that a lot of Christian theists want these places to exist. And my question would have to be, why? Both of them sound absolutely a bit- That is a generalization. There has never been a consensus on the afterlife, even going back to the Jews of Jesus' time, as there were some that denied it altogether on scriptural basis, aka the Essenes. Now, generally, there is a heaven and hell, unless you count purgatory and limbo, but I digress. You make, in my opinion, fundamentalist interpretations of heaven and hell. Heaven is never said to be a happy theme park in the sky. There is even apparently to be a war in heaven one day. Heaven is a place of honor, and granted, that comes with the perks of not feeling sad and so forth. It doesn't mean you get to just lay around all day playing a harp. Hell, likewise, you interpret as burning, which isn't really a widely ex accepted interpretation by scholars in the field. But rather, hell, at least on my terms, it can either be a place of shame, or I go with the annihilationist approach where God will just make you cease to exist once you refuse to accept him. Now, lastly, I'll say that you would have free will in heaven, you just won't have the desire to do evil, as it won't be in your nature anymore. Often, creationists will characterize the Big Bang as something magically created from nothing. But then you have creationists who literally believe a supernatural being created the entire universe. Literally something magically from nothing. My question to you is, is why is the first one irrational, but the second one logical? Oh, 
Sorry, I fell asleep and had to watch this part again. Godless Engineer is better than Horse Tranquilizer in terms of knockout power. I will say this, though. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is worse than magic. At least when a magician saws a lady in half, you have two people, a long saw, and a box. So on that basis alone, even if you consider God magical, believing God is the efficient cause that made the universe out of nothing would still be more reasonable. Now, of course, the Bible makes a difference between magic and miracles, as exemplified from Moses and his show-off with the Pharaoh's magicians. Generally, scholars have tried to separate miracles from magic, and while there isn't a universal consensus on the matter, I can offer a summary of my personal knowledge in the literature. A miracle is an event caused by a being outside the physical realm that cannot be accounted for by the natural powers of natural substances alone and merely breaks the normal causal chains of events. Magic, however, is a power drawn on by beings within the physical realm which violate the natural order and generally rely on the being's skills. Can a person simply choose to believe in something that they are not convinced of? If not, and God created our brains to require a certain level of evidence in order to be convinced, why has he chosen to not provide that level of evidence for us? Even though we both wanted to believe. I'll answer this with a few questions. What if the level of evidence required for you to believe in God was God stripping away your free will and forcing you to believe in him because outside of that nothing would convince you? Would you be perfectly fine sacrificing freedom for that sort of relationship with him? Also, don't you think it would be degrading for God to have to basically lower himself to the level of a wish-fulfilling genie and a servant of human desires, who also has to bargain with his created creatures, who ultimately just want stuff from him? We atheists get asked all the time what the basis of our morality is. It's as if because we don't have some holy book or we don't worship a god, we have no true way of having a moral compass. Call me crazy, but I don't think you have to have the promise of heaven to see that doing good is just good. Well, the basis for my morality is simple. I believe that doing the most good and the least harm benefits not only me, but those around me. I believe that things like kindness and love and laughter benefit not only me, but those around me. However, I also believe that things like judgment, condemnation, and a willful ignorance to follow something that has no basis set in reality or backed up by evidence, is ultimately harmful. And not only to me, but to those around me. So for my question, I'd like to turn the tables. What's the basis for your morality? Is it the Bible? Is it really the Bible? That same Bible that doesn't condemn slavery or rape instead it says things like if your daughter is raped she should marry her attacker or if you're a slave owner and you find yourself in the situation where your slave is unruly you are within your right to beat him within an inch of his life so many scriptures 66 books filled with thousands of pages, hundreds of thousands of words, but not one of which says that rape or slavery is morally wrong. So what's the basis for your morality again? 
I got a lot of points to make here, which shows the problems in both Kyle's statements and the problem of atheism accounting for morality. The evolutionary argument against naturalism would also apply to our moral beliefs, which would make it unlikely that our moral beliefs are true. B. You identify with Sam Harris's flourishing argument when there is no reason to identify pleasure with goodness. Being an adulterer might be pleasurable for a majority of the parties involved, but we wouldn't identify that behavior as good. C. Granting the fact that you believe in the correlation of acting good and benefiting others, I wonder what your, I wonder what your basis is for that. Plenty of people have done supposedly immoral things, believing that what they were doing is what was for best for society and was perfectly moral. What probability would you grant yourself that your version of acting good is right and all the others wrong? D. In regards to the whole judgment, condemnation, and a willful ignorance to follow something that has no basis set in reality or backed up by evidence as a harmful statement, I completely agree with you. That's why I make videos against atheists. F. I see you got your biblical scholarship from a th your third grade Sunday school teacher. As Daniel Snell shows in his book, Life in the Ancient Near East, 3100 through 332 BCE, and L.G. Perdue in the book, Families in Ancient Israel, slavery in the Old Testament times was a poverty and debt-based. Also, I'll add it was done in times of war with enemies in order to stop the enemies from fighting back against them. A History of Ancient Near Eastern Law, two volumes, by the way, by Raymond Westbrook, and Encyclopedia of Cultural Anthropology, four volumes, by David Levinson and Melvin Ember, go into the fact that ancient Near East slaves were servants in nothing like Civil War slavery. Lastly, I'll also mention that slave trading was condemned in Exodus 21.16 and 1 Timothy 1.10. This is a call back to the time they were slaves in Egypt. Did you happen to forget that Jews were constantly reminded that they used to be slaves and to be grateful for the fact that they were no longer slaves? That might be important when taking slavery into consideration, wouldn't you think? Rape would be an extension, by the way, G, Rape would be an extension of the do not steal commandment. Rape would also not be as big of a concern for ancient Jews as they lived in close proximity to one another. And if someone were to get raped, they could just scream, which is made clear in Deuteronomy 22, 23 through 24. The verse after that, along with the Sodom and Gomorrah episode and the punishment Lot's daughters got from raping... Lot shows God isn't a fan of rape. H. In regards to Deuteronomy 22, 28-29, upon closer textual analysis, this wasn't about rape, but seduction. If a man seduced a woman and got her to have sex with him, he'd have to be get married to her. Also, even if we go with your interpretation, that the, the fact of the matter is that back in ancient Judaism, Getting married wasn't about love, and in fact, marriages were arranged. The woman here would likely want to get married to the guy because she would no longer be a virgin. Thus, her bride price would be lower, making it harder for her to get married and to get the support that she needs. Also, I'll add the fact of the matter is the guy is being punished because he can never divorce her, which means he is forced to give her the support she needs. I, in regards to Exodus 21:20, atheists often failed to read the following verses before it, which talks about if two men fought hard enough and a man beat another hard enough, he would be punished. This was a matter of establishing attentions. A rod was a disciplinary weapon used on practically anyone back then who disobeyed. Corporal punishment was common. And it was a needed tool at the time because unlike you, Ka, with your modern conveniences, 
The ancient Jews had to be tough in order to survive the world as they faced death, starvation, etc. on a regular basis. J. Even if your argument were, were acceptable and rape and slavery were permitted in the Bible, the fact they would be objective commands from God would make them slightly better than man's subjective and often wrong opinion. A bad basis for objective morality is still n better than no basis for objective morality, which the atheist position falls into. K. Even if I grant you on a more naturalistic worldview that objective moral values and duties could exist, it still becomes hard to justify moral accountability and moral responsibility. If ultimately a serial killer and a charitable, person, charitable person's fate is the same, aka non-existence, why shouldn't people choose to live a completely hedonistic lifestyle? If you're sufficiently powerful and have a deal of wealth or are smart enough, you can do pretty much whatever you want in this life and never have to worry about the consequences. Also, it would be hard to justify free will in a purely physical universe, and without free will you can't have moral responsibility as you can't be held accountable for an action you have no control over. Overall, these are just all the problems that I I'll go, I go, went over with you. Purely, I am a nihilist, so I do not believe in objective morality. But I can simply say that if objective morality were to exist, that a personal God that gives out divine commands would simply be a better, better explanation for it. And that concludes the series of Deistic Substitution, Answering Atheist in Place of Christians. I hope you guys enjoyed everything that I produced. Leave a subscribe, leave a like, comment, and hope to see you again soon. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise.